Hello everybody and welcome to our x talk on careers in veterinary pathology. My name is Katie and I'm a farm animal veterinary pathologist at the University of Nottingham in the UK and I'm going to be joined by a few other speakers today uh, to tell you all about our jobs in veterinary pathology. Before we get started, um, we just want to say a big thank you to Xwell for making this uh, possible. We think it's amazing and, and it's really fantastic that we can talk to so many people all around the world about veterinary pathology. Um, so thank you to Xwell. And a quick so today I'm going to start by giving a very quick overview on what we mean by veterinary pathology. And then we'll go straight into the talks with five different speakers um, covering clinical pathology, anatomic pathology, uh, working in a diagnostic lab, working in research labs, um, working as a toxicological pathologist, and also what it's like to work in academia. And this will cover um, along the way uh, working with uh, all the different species as well. So. Just to let you know, these talks are all pre-recorded, um, but we will hopefully, as many of us as possible, be joining for a live Q&A session at the end. So please do save your questions um, and we can have a discussion and answer as many of those questions as possible once we get to the end of the talk. Very broadly, veterinary pathology is the study of disease in animals, and this covers everything from the cellular level, where we might be talking about proteins and DNA, up to the gross lesions that we see in animals on post-mortem examination. As you'll see today, veterinary pathologists can work in a huge range of different jobs. So veterinary pathology is split into two main branches. There is some overlap and some people will work across both areas, but this very much depends on the job and on the individual. The clinical pathology is all about diagnosing disease based on the analysis of bodily fluids like blood and urine, or by examining cells on cytology collected through tissue aspirates. Anatomic pathology is all about diagnosing disease through the examination of organs and tissues, and this includes post-mortem examinations of animals that have died, um, as well as histopathology, either on tissues collected from necropsies or on samples that have been submitted from live animals as biopsies. So if you want to know more about veterinary pathology, please do go back to some of the talks that have already been shown on Wells website. Um, and also just a quick note that we won't be covering forensic veterinary pathology today because my colleague Winsom recently did a talk on this as well. So you can find this on the x website. So there's a few different pathways you can take if you want to work solely in veterinary pathology. But also, you do find aspects of veterinary pathology in other parts of veterinary medicine as well, and I think that's really important to remember. You might not want to be a veterinary pathologist, but actually if you're really interested in it, then there are certainly lots of other places that you can find it. So most of us for the first time will meet veterinary pathology at veterinary school, and here it might be included as its own standalone module or embedded within other modules. Your university might also have a student group that you can join as well. You might then go and work in clinical practice. And here actually day to day, you're going to be doing quite a lot of pathology. So you might be taking and analyzing blood samples, examining urine down the microscope, or swabbing dogs with bad ears to find out what might be causing the problem. Here in the UK, some veterinary surgeons working in farm animal practice do a fair number of post-mortem examinations themselves. And certainly poultry vets here will do a large number of post-mortems as part of their clinical work. So if veterinary pathology is something you're interested in, but you don't want to do it as a full time career. Just remember that there are lots of other places that you can find aspects of it. You might want to work solely in veterinary pathology, and that's what the talks today will focus on. So there is some potential for going straight from vet school into a veterinary pathology job, but this will very much depend on where you are in the world and what positions are available. The jobs might, however, require further experience and qualifications. And again, this will vary depending on the job and where it's based. So here in the UK, many jobs will ask for European or American college diplomats or for individuals to be a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists. Requirements to gain these further qualifications will vary, but to become an American or European diplomat, you'll need to complete a three year residency. And certainly for the European college, you'll need prior experience either through working in clinical practice or completing an internship. So I say three years for a residency, but again, this depends on the programme and it depends where you are. And they can be longer if you're completing the programme part time alongside other commitments. So the training will make you eligible to sit the board certifying examinations at the end of the residency program. And when you have successfully passed these, you become a diplomat and can then go into work in veterinary pathology as a specialist. 
So again, you can go down this road almost straight from vet school, or you might come into it from another route. So you might go into clinical practice first and then start a residency, or you might head straight to a career in veterinary pathology without further qualifications and where there will be training on the job. And again, this all depends on where you are and what positions are available. So there's lots of different ways to do it. If you know what job you'd like to do, but you aren't sure of how to get there, then find somebody already doing that job and ask how they got there. People are usually very happy to talk about what you need to do to be able to get a certain job. So don't be afraid to ask people what's required. We hope you enjoy the talk today and I will join you with the other speakers for the live Q&A session at the end. Thank you. Hello. So my name is Dr. Melanie Dobromilski and I'm going to talk to you today about life as a diagnostic histopathologist working predominantly with small animals. So in a fairly short space of time, I'm going to try and give you an idea of my job working as a small animal diagnostic histopathologist, uh, including a little bit about the company I work for, um, the types of services we provide, our client base, and a little bit about the work-life balance uh, of where I work at the moment. I'll also try and talk a little bit about my own personal background and how I got to where I am now, which is a slightly alternative route compared to some people, um, but it worked for me. And then I'll try and finish off with a little bit about why I like working so much in, a, in, in diagnostic histopathology in particular. One thing you should know about me from the very start is that I am a real cat fanatic. So this is definitely my preferred profile shot. And if they would use this for all of my talks, I would be very happy. Um, this is one of my six cats. This is Willow, back when she was still a very tiny kitten. Uh, there's a growing community of veterinary and human pathologists over on Twitter, so um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, it's a good idea to come and maybe follow some people over there. So this is my own personal account. Um, there is some pathology, but be warned there are also quite a lot of cat photos on there as well. So I work for a company called Fin Pathologists and we're part of quite a large veterinary corporate group or that also owns a large number of practices, mostly small animal with some equine and some farm animal in there as well. They also have several referral centres, crematoria, um, they do a, a wide range of things within the veterinary sort of um, industry. So we're actually part of the laboratory division together with our sister laboratory called Axiom. We are a quite large commercial diagnostic laboratory um, and we are based in the UK. We're actually very rural where we're sited. It's um, deep in the Norfolk, Suffolk countryside, um, which for me personally, I think is an absolutely wonderful place to work, but maybe it's not for everybody. I'm actually part of a very diverse team. There's now 17 of us based at Finns, um, and between us we cover pretty much everything species-wise. Our workload is mostly small animals, so that's dogs and cats, um, but we also have growing equine and farm animal teams, um, and we cover more exotic species as well, including everything from small fairies, so rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, through to more exotic pets like birds, reptiles and snakes, through to animals from zoological collections as well. So we, we are very diverse in that we pretty much cover between us all of the different species. We're also very diverse in that we come from a wide range of backgrounds. Um, some of us have come from clinical practice, others from academia, others from, from different laboratories. We've trained um, in vet schools, we've trained via places like the APHA. So we've all trained in quite different ways and we've come from different places and I personally think that that makes us a really strong team. Between us we can pretty much handle anything um, and we have a huge amount of accumulated knowledge for years and years and years worth. The bulk of our work is in the form of biopsies and those are mostly from dogs and cats. We don't offer a post-mortem service ourselves as we just we don't have the facilities and to be honest in a commercial setting it's quite difficult to cover the costs of doing a post-mortem unless you can do a lot of them in a very sort of economical way um, or if you charge a lot for the service and it's, it's just not really financially viable for us to do this. Um, what we do do is we do report on histopathology samples submitted by vets um, who are doing post-mortems out in the field or in practices and we do offer guidance to those vets um, when they're performing the PMs themselves as well. We do a wide range of immunohistochemical staining in-house as well and as pathologists we're involved in the interpretations of those stains so that's another really interesting part of what we do and this picture here is of a recent case of mine um, where I had a very poorly differentiated tumour from a, a young dog um, and this is a nice, uh, it's an epithelial cell marker called cytokeratin so you can see this, the neoplastic cells are nice and positive stain, that's the brown coloration. 
The majority of our clients are from first opinion practices um, and most of them are from within the UK, although we do actually receive biopsies from all around the world. Um, we have a lot of work that comes in from Scandinavian countries, but also more exotic places, so Hong Kong occasionally or Dubai. Um, so basically, if you can get a sample in the post to us, we'll report it for you. I really like working with first opinion um, vets. I particularly enjoy that it's part of my job. Um, I like helping them to resolve their cases, particularly the really difficult ones. Um, and I do enjoy this link back into the clinical world and the clinical setting. A growing number of our clients are actually from referral practices um, and this offers a slightly different workload and a bit more variety. Um, these clients are looking for something slightly different from their histopath reports um, and they will often phone up and, and discuss cases as well. I do enjoy the chance to work with other specialists from, from other areas. Um, I see it as a chance to learn from them as well um, and that also feeds back into the service that we provide for all of our clients because we are learning from experts in oncology, in surgery, in internal medicine as well. So that's a really, really interesting part of my work at the moment. Back when I started at Finns in 2012, we were a smaller group um, and we nearly all worked on site and we worked on glass slides. But back in 2016, Finns went digital um, and this has changed how we work somewhat. So all of our pathologists, whether they were on site or off, um, went to working digitally. Um, and this meant we could start recruiting people working off site and remote from us, so not in Norfolk. Uh, and this has meant recruitment for us of new pathologists is much, much easier. It means that although we still have a core on-site team, we also have a growing number of pathologists who work remotely for us. Um, and some of these are in other parts of the UK, so down in Devon maybe, or up in Scotland, but some of them are actually international. So we have one person who works in South Africa for us um, and another in the Czech Republic. Um, so we have a growing number of pathologists who work off site. Um, and the other great thing is that it offers a great deal of flexibility, which I'll, I'll come back and talk about um, a bit later. We do have a website, so if you'd like to learn a bit more about FINS and what we do, we're more than just a histopathology team, as we also have ClinPath, Microbiology, Hematology, Biochemistry. So do have a look at the website, um, read a bit more about who we are, um, who we have in our team and who works for us. Uh, if you look under the Resources tab, you'll also find some fact sheets, um, which some of which you might be interested to read. Um, they're aimed at our clients and they cover things like how to do a PM, um, the various prognostic tests for mast cell tumours, mycobacteriosis, and companion animals, um, all sorts of things. So do, do feel free to have a look. So moving on to how I spend my time. Um, the majority of our time is spent reporting cases. So that's looking at slides like this um, and writing reports for clients. Um, that is why we're here and that is always our primary aim. So it's, it's to provide an excellent and fast service to our clients. That's our number one priority um, and that is the bulk of what we do. Um, there may also be phone calls from clients if they want to talk about a particular case. Um, maybe they want to talk about additional testing or sometimes there are more general advice calls about which samples the client should send um, or which test would be most appropriate or perhaps how to do a post-mortem in their practice. Um, personally, I really enjoy these chances to interact with our clients. Um, it's really nice to be able to help people with these challenging cases. Most of the samples are trimmed in by our specially trained technicians. Um, however, there are a small number of cases which require a pathologist to examine the gross specimen and to trim it in. Uh, and these fall to the on-site pathologist to do, like myself. Sometimes these can be really interesting because I guess this is really the only gross pathology that we get to do. So for example, um, here's a dog's brain which I sectioned in recently and I found the tumor, which was quite exciting. Um, and here is a, a cat heart. Um, I personally have quite interest in feline cardiomyopathies so the technicians know I get really excited if a cat heart comes in and I'll come down and I'll I'll weigh it and I'll trim it and I'll examine it and measure it etc. So apart from the actual cases um, all of the team members are encouraged to develop their own areas of interest and expertise um, and then this allows them to support other team members if they've got difficult cases. So for me personally this involves um, feline pathology is a, is a really key part of what I'm interested in um, but also I'm involved in developing the immunohistochemistry that we do in-house um, and also building up relationships with our referral practice clients as I've said that's, that's 
one of my kind of lead areas personally. Um, but others in the group have interest in, say, oral pathology or ocular pathology or perhaps gastrointestinal, liver or skin pathology. Um, others will specialise in particular species, so perhaps avian pathology or equine or farm animal species. So there is a huge chance to develop any interest that you might particularly have. And then other people in the team will probably come and refer to you if they've got a difficult case. Um, so for example, if someone's got a weird cat case, um, I'm generally the person they go to for a second opinion. Although it isn't the mainstay of what we do, so unlike in academia or say research, um, there are plenty of opportunities to do other things if that's what you want to do. So you don't have to, but um, and there's no expectation, but if you want to, the opportunities are certainly there. So, for example, teaching. Um, I've been involved in teaching undergrads, um, vets in practice coming for a visit. Um, we have our own in-house pathology resident who I've, I've, I've helped train. Um, but we also have um, visiting pathology residents who want to come and experience life in a commercial diagnostic setting, for example. And I'm involved in several PhD projects as well. So the opportunities are certainly there if you want to do that sort of thing. Writing, um, we can write fact sheets for clients, for example, those on the website, um, but I've also written articles for various journals, um, basically sort of giving advice to, to people in general practice on pathology related topics. So there are also plenty of opportunities to collaborate with others, um, to write up case reports um, and to become involved in research projects if that's something that you, you're interested in. Like I say, it isn't the majority of what we do, but it is possible to do these things from within a commercial setting. Work-life balance, I would say, is excellent. Um, my typical working day starts around half past eight and would finish anywhere between five and 5.30. That's five days a week. Um, we're also able to be incredibly flexible. So we have people who work compressed hours, um, so they do a four-day week. Others are part-time and do three days or maybe even only two days a week, or others work five half days. Some people work from home permanently, others work on site, and some people work a mixture of on site and off site primarily to suit them. Uh, with COVID, we had to shift pretty much overnight from on site and remote working to everybody working from home. Um, apart from me, for a little while, I was the only pathologist left on site. But the really nice thing about digital system is that we were actually able to cope with that really, really well. So I think there's there's a huge scope for, for, for work life balance. And uh, this is to remind me of what working from home used to look like. Um, I never did it as a routine because it meant carting home the microscope and all the slides. Um, and I only did it if I had a particular project that I wanted to work on in my own time. Um, but now working from home looks much more like the other picture. Um, so I currently have an office on site, um, but I also have a workstation in my study at home and I can just transition between the two and it's really easy. At the moment, because my husband has been unfurloughed, um, but the kids' school are still closed. I'm actually working from home Thursdays and Fridays um, and the ability to be flexible is just absolutely great. Uh, this is to remind me, although <laughs> some of the issues are still the same, um, note that the decoy laptop didn't work and neither did the open notebook. She knew exactly which laptop to sit on. She's a very clever cat. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the research I do, probably because it's a little bit different to how other research is done by pathologists, but it does tie in with my work. Um, this is an illustration of what can happen. So I received an interesting biopsy from a mass on a cat's toe. The histopathology looked really funky. Um, there were multinucleate giant cells, there was osseous metaplasia, there were these really proliferative looking spindle cells, and I'd not come across anything like it before. So I showed it to my colleagues and they all said, oh yeah, we, we do see these occasionally. But no one really knows what they are. Um, they could be reactive, they could be a tumour, they could be something aggressive like a sarcoma. Don't know. And so a project is born. Um, so what we do, we collect together a set of similar cases. We collaborate with colleagues and other laboratories. Um, we put together a set of maybe 41 in this particular case of these um, cat toe lesions. We find out from practitioners what happened to these cases, what the outcomes were, and at the same time we review the histopathology to determine what the key features are. Uh, and then you publish the results as we've done here. And in this particular case, it turned out that these were completely benign lesions. They weren't tumours. Um, they could recur locally if you didn't completely excise them, but they never invaded the bone and they did not metastasize. So it was a good news story for the cats. 
So here I've got some pictures of the multinucleate giant cells, um, which can be a really prominent feature. Also got some areas of bone formation as well. So the cases that I see are what stimulate the research ideas. And without the cases, I don't think I would get so many ideas. But also where I work, we have a huge caseload, which means a great archive for retrospective studies in particular. And it also means the results I get are directly applicable to my caseload because I'm answering the questions that I really want to know the answers to. And often these involve getting better prognostic data, which in turn obviously helps my clients. So how on earth did I get here? It certainly wasn't by a traditional route. Um, as a veterinary student, I was really interested in doing research. I was already passionate about feline medicine and I was really into immunology. I wasn't at all sure about going into practice. What I did do was I made the most of all of the opportunities that were presented to me. And I think this is really important and I'd advise you to do the same. If you are curious, go find out more experience lots of different things and make the most of any chances that come your way. So for me, that included doing an interclase degree, which happened to be in pathology because there was a chance to do a research project. I also did a summer school, which was again another chance to do some research. And I made the most of my EMS placements to explore the different possibilities. Uh, once I graduated, I still didn't feel ready to go into practice, so I did a small animal internship, um, which gave me my clinical experience, and that's really, really helped me in my subsequent career. I would recommend that people interested in pathology do consider doing some time in clinical practice as well, um, because I think it will really benefit you. From there, um, my interest in immunology led me to do a PhD simply because it was a really interesting PhD and it's what I wanted to do. There was no plan really there. Um, having done the PhD, which was very molecular and lab based and there was no sort of clinical aspect to it at all, I really missed the clinical side of stuff. So this kind of led me to doing the residency in pathology because it was kind of combining um, laboratory work, but also the clinical side of things. And although I started off as a, in a traditional residency program at a university uh, at the vet school in Glasgow, that didn't really suit me. And when the second baby came along, I actually dropped out of that because it wasn't financially viable and I, I couldn't make it work. What I eventually ended up doing was a joint residency with Finns, where I am now, and the RVC. And rather than going for boards, I went for the FRC path. Now, this personally suited me really well. Veterinary pathology is such a broad subject, um, but the way I trained, it was on the job and it allowed me to focus from early on onto the areas that I really enjoyed, and that was the small animal diagnostic work. Um, and that really worked well for me personally. So whilst sort of working on the job at Finns, um, I managed to get my FRC path in 2015, uh, got specialist status in 2016. And um, because I wanted to carry on the link and the collaborations with the RVC, I've actually got an honorary lectureship there. And then that allows me to carry on working with them and to do a bit of teaching and a bit of research. And literally yesterday, I found out that I've also been awarded the FRCVS. So it just goes to show that you can do these things from a commercial background rather than simply being in academia. What do I like about my job? Well, bear in mind that when I was where you are now and a student, I didn't even know this type of job existed. So if I'd known that, maybe I would have gone into pathology earlier. I don't know. What I really like is being able to focus on the bits that I like the most. And for me, that's small animals and that's the diagnostics. I love being part of the big team at Finns. Um, that works really well for me, being able to to talk to colleagues and bounce ideas around. It was really fab. Um, the fact that I'm always learning new things and even the people around me who've been in pathology for decades, they still learn new things too. So I know that's never gonna stop. Uh, I love the chance to interact with our clients, um, helping them solve their difficult cases. That, that really does give me a buzz. Um, the chance to develop, the chance to collaborate. And actually, despite what people think about working in a commercial lab, there's a huge amount of variety in what we do. So it really is, it, it depends on what you make of it. If you're interested and you're passionate and you want to do these things, then it can be um, an incredibly satisfying job. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Anne Awarindi. I'm a resident in veterinary clinical pathology and I reside in the UK. I graduated from the University of Ibadan in 2004 and I've migrated to the UK ever since then. So 
Why did I choose clinical pathology? My interest started back in vet school. I was particularly keen on all the laboratory based teaching sessions that we partook of as vet students. And wherever there was a microscope, I was so keen to look under to see what I could find. My undergraduate research project was largely lab based <clears throat> and it involved taking nasal swabs from healthy and clinically unwell horses at the Lagos Polo Club. As a result of this, I spent a lot of time in the lab testing these samples. I also work in the hematology department at Axiom and partaking of sessions with clinical pathologists at that time, as well as interaction with vets, just fueled my interest in clinical pathology. My mentor used to say, clinical pathology can be summed up in two words, pattern recognition. He said to me, Anne, if you are able to recognize the pattern of any condition or disease, then you've pretty much mastered the art of clinical pathology. Pretty much like riding a bike, you can never forget it once you've learned it. I spent a total of 10 years working in the hematology department. In the last three years of this role, I started becoming aware that there was so much more I could be doing. But my limitations at that time were that although I was a qualified vet from Nigeria, I couldn't register with the Royal College without sitting the MRCVS examinations. So I spent the last three years of this role seeing practice, which involved visiting farm animal practices, small animal practices, equine practices and farms, just to learn how veterinary practice is performed in the UK in preparation for the membership exams. I was very grateful to have been successful on first attempt. And this made it possible for me to be able to apply for residency positions. And I was pleased that Axiom was able to offer me the role as a resident. So what is my current role? I'm a third year clinical pathology resident doing a combined residency with um, the University of Nottingham. I work as a member of a team of vets that include internal medicine specialists, um, farm vets, as well as the equine vets. And we look at a variety of cytology and hematology cases, which ranges from small animal, large animal, farm animal, and also to exotic species, including rabbits, guinea pigs, fish, you name it. There never really is a dull moment. I'm also doing a master's in veterinary medicine at the University of Nottingham. And this topic of my project is called feline lymphoma and specifically is feline lymphoma worth treating. This involves looking at um, retrospectively on cases of feline lymphoma and determining whether immunophenotype has any clinical significance relating to how long these cats survive for. When I started working at Axiom as a resident, my caseload was three cases a day. This was then increased to five cases a day, then to 10 cases, 15, up to the point where I can comfortably read 20 cases a day. And this comprises a combination of cytology and hematology cases. Although having said that, in instances where these cases are very complicated, I'm unable to meet these numbers, but this is mostly rare. I also do some clinical chemistry and endocrinology back validation, and this involves looking at um, reports that have come off the analyzer and assessing them to see whether um, these results fit with the clinical history. And this also involves writing an interpretation based on the findings from those results. One of my roles also involves performing telephone consultation with vets in practice, and this generally involves 
offering them advice based on either a report I'd written or just general advice on what to do, what samples to take from the animals and things around laboratory analysis. The company I work for is called Axiom, but it's actually owned by a corporate veterinary group called Consolidated Veterinary Services, CVS Group. And this group owns over 500 vet surgeries throughout the UK, Netherlands and Republic of Ireland. They also operate four laboratories, including our laboratory, um, that perform diagnostic services um, to the veterinary industry. And they also own um, seven pet crematoria. Another thing that CVS do is operate an online dispensary that sells um, veterinary medicines, pet food, and other related um, products, for instance, shampoos and um, anything that basically can be used um, for pet care. I've put up this slide um, because there are very good resources as well as details of organizations that are very helpful for vet students. Some of you may have actually come across this in vet school. Um, it also helps support residents as well as qualified clinical pathologists. EclinPath is particularly a very brilliant online resource. There's lots of information regarding you name whatever clinical pathology terms or, or details that you need to find. That's a very brilliant website for, for such information. Um, for journals, both recent and old journals, VetClinPath is a very good uh, journal. The Facebook page, um, Cytology Coffee Cases and Conversations, is one that I'm um, uh, joined, and it's a very useful um, one for photos. So, if, for instance, um, photos of different things are placed on, on this website, and people can access them, ask questions, and if they're not sure of something, someone hopefully would have seen that condition and will be able to provide an answer or uh, some clinical advice relating to that condition. So you're welcome to ask to become a member. I don't think it's very hard to join this group because it's basically for even vet students are allowed to join. And the European Society of Vet Clinical Pathologists, again, is a very good um, governing body that help to provide training, CPDs, as well as um, membership routes to becoming a clinical pathologist. And likewise, the American Society of Vet Clinical Pathologists um, I'm preparing to sit for the Royal College of Pathologists um, exam in September. Again, this is a, a brilliant body. The only thing about them is that they also embody medical um, training pathologists as well. So clinical pathology is actually a very small arm of um, the Royal College of Pathologists. Thank you very much for giving me time to speak to you briefly on my career in clinical pathology. I hope some of the things I've said would have inspired you and would make you consider pursuing this career route. I will leave with you my email address should you wish to contact me or ask any further questions. Thank you very much. Well, hello everybody. My name is Albert Canturri. I'm a European board certified veterinary pathologist working on a PhD here in the University of Minnesota. My PhD is focused on swine infectious diseases. So today I'm very happy to talk to you about careers in veterinary pathology. In my case, I will talk to you about research and academia. So, as you will see at the end of my lecture and with the experience gathered from other speakers and myself, um, the best thing about veterinary pathology, in my opinion, is that it's very diverse. It's, it opens you a lot of doors, so you can work in a lot of different aspects of veterinary pathology when you finish, when you have your board certification or you have experience. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to apologize for not having my camera on, so I tried many times with my personal computer and with the office computer, and it didn't work, so sorry about that.
Um, since there is people here from everywhere of the world, I wanted to start my presentation showing uh, from where I come from, showing my little country. Um, my little country is called Andorra, is in is located in Europe between France and Spain. And it's very, very, very tiny. So we are only 70,000 citizens in my country. So, um, you know, to compare, it's, it's valuable to, to say that there is more people in the University of Minnesota in my workplace than in my country. So, yeah. So, a little bit of my academic background. Um, I, well, when I was 18, uh, I had to leave my country because uh, it's so small that we don't have a, a university there. So I moved to Spain, to Zaragoza, to, to spend, and I spent five years in vet school. So, so for, from 2009 to 2014. And during the last two years, especially in the fourth and fifth grades, I get involved with, I get interested in pathology and I started to collaborate with the department of pathology doing necropsies almost every day. So at that moment, I knew that uh, pathology was made for me, so uh, more or less. So I moved to Barcelona uh, to do a, an internship in veterinary anatomic pathology in the department of, of, the, of the University of Barcelona. So you may know Barcelona because uh, we have the best football team in the world. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then yeah, an internship, I wanted to talk to you about an internship because I think it's an experience that I would recommend to everybody that it's starting, um, not only in veterinary pathology, but in other disciplines inside uh, veterinary uh, science, because it gives you the opportunity to, to know and you know, to discover if, if you like it or not, right? So um, you... Maybe you start the residency and then you discover that this is not for you. So doing a, an internship is, is better. Um, and it's mandatory now in Europe before doing a residency. Then um, I did an internship for one year and then I, I was lucky to get involved or to get involved to the residency in anatomic pathology in the same institution in the University of Barcelona. So that was more dedicated, that was more intensive and more focused on board examination. So the residency is hard. Um, maybe the others have already talk, taught you that. Uh, the residency in pathology is a hard time, but it's, it was academically, it was maybe my, the best um, time period in my, in my career because you learn lots of different things from lots of different people and, and it's amazing. And then I sat the exam in 2019. I was lucky to, to pass uh, my board examination in that same year. And then I worked as a pathologist for the few months that I had left uh, before moving to the University of Minnesota in the United States of America to start my PhD in the swine group. So a little bit about Barcelona, the residence in Barcelona. Um, we have, well, I have worked with all animal species, but mainly focused on food animals and companion animals. We had a, also a fair amount of exotic and wildlife cases, such as this whale that you can see here. And um, so, yeah, this is why I wanted to focus on swine, because I like this species and I think um, they have a very interesting pathology. Um, and also we had the, I had the opportunity, we have the luck in the University of, uh, of Barcelona to have a CRESA. CRESA is a research center, an animal research center with a high biosecurity laboratory, so a BSL-3. And then I had the opportunity to work with classical swine fever, a typical porcine pestivirus and, and tuberculosis, for example. So uh, this is, you know, in the context of research, not only uh, in the context of diagnostics, such as the, the residency. So I think this triggered my curiosity and my idea to, to do research and to learn how to do good research. So independently of these routine diagnostic duties um, that you have everyday cases, um, being involved in research uh, studies involving in this case pathology, opened my mind and, and, and yeah, it was the seed 
and for the the next PhD that I'm I'm working on now. So yeah, that was my question one year ago or some. I am an ECBP diplomat, and now what? So as I said, I just just said the residency prepares you for becoming a diagnostician, but you need. I think it's this is a, my personal opinion. I think you need more than than that to be a a good researcher. So. As I said at the beginning, anatomic pathology is, is give you a broad base. So you have to know or to get insights about anatomy, physiology, microbiology, immunology, um, etc. Metabolic diseases, cancer. So um, you get to know a lot of things during the during, during the residency and in, in pathology. But, and I have to say that pathologies are very much wanted as part of research teams because, you know, this versatility and this uh, broad scientific thinking. But I think it's, it's not enough for research. So um, to do good research, you need more than that. Um, you need to know or to have knowledge on statistics, for example, epidemiology, ethics, grant writing, uh, molecular biology, etc. And then you have to work hands-on in the lab. Um, so you need lab-based research and then field work, going to farms, uh, getting in, to in contact with clients, etc. So, so this is what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm taking classes in the veterinary medicine graduate program and in the School of Public Health of, the, of here in the University of Minnesota. It's one of the best public health schools in the, in the country. And I'm learning how to do good research. This is what I'm doing right now, doing my PhD. And well, at the end, at the end of, of it, when I'm when I finish my PhD, maybe my future goal would be to to combine because I'm I still I am still passionate about diagnostics. I I cannot live without a microscope, but at the same time, I want to I want to to combine these diagnostic pathology duties with research activities, either in the public here in the academia or in the private sector. So specifically, um, I'm, following, I'm following the, the SWINE program here in the, in the University of Minnesota, and it's intended to specialize the student uh, in all aspects related to SWINE. So in my, in my program, in this, my, my office uh, mates, are, we, are, we have different backgrounds. Some of them come from academia, some of them come from the private sector, from production, from uh, some, um, some of them have background in virology specifically, I have background in pathology. So the backgrounds are different, um, but um, uh, we all um, need to, to know about uh, disease pathogenesis, these aspects of all related to swine. So disease pathogenesis, immunology, control, uh, nutrition, welfare, public health, antimicro antimicrobial use, etc. A lot of epidemiology too, production. So it's very specialized on swine uh, and it's, very, it's one of the best swine programs in, in the world, I would say. So as you see here, my current PhD program is, is I am working on molecular diagnostics. I'm not working specifically in anything related to pathology. Specifically, I'm working on, a, on the development of a messenger RNA-based uh, real-time PCR for the detection of mycoplasma hynomonia in vitro. So I am part of the mycoplasma research lab here in the University of Minnesota. And one would think that this is totally unrelated to pathology, and sure it is, but I'm, I'm still sure and I know that the knowledge that I gained from my pathology residency and my background in pathology will help me a lot in this project. So now to finish um, this lecture, the take home messages for me are three. So, and this is a personal opinion, maybe the others think other things, but um, this is personal to me. I think being a diagnostician is not, is not enough um, to do research. So of course you can participate in uh, research studies um, if there is a part of pathology or you can be in, char in charge of that part. But I think you need more uh, other things, you know, to, to know how to plan a study, to do the study design, the treatment of data, um, to manage results, everything. So um, 
I just I wanted I I didn't want to be part of a of a study. I I wanted to to get the knowledge to to become maybe the principal investigator of a research study. So how I see is is how I see research is this is uh, for me research is like a tree uh, with many branches and the more the more you know the specific branches individually so the the pathology branch the immunology branch uh, epidemiology branch uh, biostatistics the more you get to know the the tree in in its fullness and last uh, lastly and just for you to know that uh, pathologists are very valued in research group as they have this unique expertise of performing histopathology and other diagnostic techniques. But also because, as, as I already said, um, we have a broad base. So we know, we tend to, to say that we know a little bit of many, many different aspects of veterinary sciences. So, so yeah, um, I encourage you to follow, if you want to, um, the, the pathology track because it's very rewarding at least in my experience and this is it thank you for your attention and i'll be happy to take any questions thank you hello everyone my name is laura Poyedo, and i work as a toxicology pathologist in anapath a contract research organization based in switzerland Today, I would like to briefly introduce you to toxicologic pathology as a very interesting path to take on your future career. So, I guess at this point, many of you wonder what is the role of a toxicologic pathologist. Toxicologic pathologists have a crucial role in development of medical products. And to understand this, I'm going to very briefly explain the pipeline of a biopharmaceutical. There are two main phases. Preclinical studies, here in orange, and clinical studies. The former correspond to the different stages of research before testing in humans, and during which important feasibility, efficacy, and drug safety data are collected. As an example, to make it a bit clearer, imagine that the interest of a research team is to find a more efficient drug against malaria. During preclinical, a research team will investigate and select the most suitable compound candidate to find plasmodium, which will be further tested in in vitro and animal models. At this step is where the toxicologic pathologists will carry out the scientific evaluation and interpretation of the pathology data from the experiments, which together with in vitro and in vivo data will lead to safety and efficacy reports to submit to the regulatory authorities. If the report is favorable for the compound and it is considered safe, this product will go into a clinical phase where it will be tested in humans in different trials. This will lead to reports from human clinical data, which will be presented to the authorities before being approved for marketing. So, how is the workflow for a toxicologic pathologist for each project? First of all, for each project, there will be an initial discussion of the feasibility of the project. It will be evaluated if the study design addresses important questions, such as, for example, possible toxicological adverse findings resulting from exposure to the compound, which is the optimal dose, the pharmacodynamics of the drug. As well, it will be evaluated if the animal model is the most appropriate one for the study. Rodents and rabbits are probably the most common species, but also rare species like fish and frogs are becoming more and more frequent. Also, which organs to evaluate um, when normally it is reviewed pre-existing literature on the study compound or similar. And this moment will be also the moment to put on the table the use of complementary special techniques to support the data. After this, the next step for the toxicologic pathologist on the project will be 
the necropsy histotechnic supervision in case of a non rutinary study. Then the pathologist will evaluate the tissue and will start writing a report including this pathological data together with the analysis of special technique results and the complementary data from the in vivo phase, such as biochemistry, hematology, and the urinalysis. The final report will include a safety and sometimes also efficacy statement based on all these results. And which are the special techniques you will work with beyond hematocylinosin, the classical histological stain? So it depends on the nature of the compound and the purpose of the study, right? The range is very broad. Findings for these projects are often generous. In our company, it can go from a simple PCR to the use of a particle accelerator to characterize the composition of nanoparticles. But here are some examples of the most common ones we use. Probably the most, the most common one is the image analysis. For example, as you see in the image, to measure the dimensions of the arterial layers in relation to the use of an arterial stent. Here is the tunica intima. Uh, the less growth of the tunica intima, the least lumen stenosis, and therefore the performance of the stent is considered better, right? Um, of course, Immunistochemistry, for example, to work with uh, cancer uh, therapies. We use sometimes as well laser scanning to detect, for example, sperm anomalies. In the use of hyperspectral analysis for compound identification of certain characteristics and the distribution in the tissues. Vascular image analysis using angiofilm technique, laser capture for focusing the study to particular microscopic areas. Um, nowadays, it is becoming more and more useful in pathology the use of deep learning and um, artificial intelligence. And we try to implement these techniques in our studies nowadays more and more. So what is exciting from toxicology pathologies? Me, what I enjoy the most is to work in multidisciplinary teams. You may find in your team molecular biologists, chemists, pharmacologists, engineers, material science. So you will keep everyday learning and broadening your area of knowledge. As well, it is very stimulating to face a wide variety of research, pharmacological studies, medical device, nanoparticles, genetic treatments, immunomodulators. So all of this will lead to non-stop learning working days that despite very demanding, they will be also brain stimulating with a constant generation of new ideas. And which are the previous education and general requirements for becoming a toxicological pathologist? I would say veterinary studies with a PhD, um, better if it's with pathology specialization, are generally required to understand research behind the studies. Nowadays, more frequently, there is demand of board pathology certifications such as ECVP or ACVP. However, during this education, training in toxicological pathology is quite limited, so most training occurs on the job. If you find this kind of pathology path appealing to you, I really encourage you to go for it. It requires high investment in education, but it will definitely be rewarded with very interesting projects and good job conditions. And for more information, I would suggest you to follow the link to the European Society of Toxicologic Pathology, where you will find interesting information on training and annual meetings, open positions, regulatory guidance, and much more. And that's all for my part. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best for your future career.
Hello again everybody, um, so I am the final speaker for today and I'm going to be talking about farm animal pathology and also what it's like to work as a veterinary pathologist in academia. So a little bit about me to start with, I graduated from the University of Bristol in 2008 with my veterinary science degree. I then worked in veterinary practice for five years and this was mainly mixed and farm animal practice, uh, but I did also do a small amount of small animal locum work and I definitely found that working clinically across the species really helped with the learning that I had to do for my pathology residency later on. It was during my time in farm animal practice that I decided um, farm animal pathology was the career I wanted to pursue, um, but it did take me um, a little while to get there. So I, I came to the University of Nottingham um, and did a PhD, which I finished in 2017. And during the um, this time of my PhD, I was very uh, lucky um, to get some funding for an anatomic pathology residency, so kindly funded by AHDB um, and MSD Animal Health. Um, and uh, this was a residency that had a very large focus on farm animal pathology. So I was based at the University of Nottingham, but I spent a large amount of my time at Farm Postmortems Limited, um, which is a private postmortem provider up in the north of England, um, where I got to see a, a big farm animal caseload. I became a di diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Pathologists uh, earlier this year, um, and I have stayed at Nottingham to work as a farm animal veterinary pathologist. So both uh, clinical pathologists and anatomic pathologists are needed to work in vet schools so that we can teach the next generation of veterinary surgeons and hopefully the next generation of veterinary pathologists. So the work that you do as a vet veterinary pathologist in academia is broadly split into three areas, teaching, research and diagnostics. And the amount of each of those that you do will depend on what you want to do, uh, what your job description is um, and what your university uh, expects of you. Um, so uh, it can vary quite a lot. So there's quite a lot of scope for flexibility. Um, so for example, at, at Nottingham here, we've got a clinical pathologist um, that has a big interest in endocrinology. Um, we've got a uh, anatomic pathologist that's really into neuropathology. And um, you've already met my colleague, Winsome, who has a, a big interest in forensic pathology. Um, so uh, really quite a big scope for um, different interests and different ways to spend your time. So teaching can really vary from um, teaching lectures in a lecture theatre to big groups of students, uh, or certainly that was how we used to do it. Um, uh, and um, teaching histology to first and second year students, through to um, teaching the final year vet students in the post-mortem room. So here at Nottingham, in normal times, um, we have the final year vet students in the post-mortem room on necrosity duty with us um, for two weeks uh, in, during their final year um, clinical rotations. And we also are involved in teaching postgraduate students. So at Nottingham, we've got three veterinary pathology residents. We've also got uh, farm residents who um, often come and join us in the post-mortem room um, to, to be involved with the post-mortem examinations. And then there's um, usually a few uh, PhD students that might be involved in various projects that involve uh, either sort of gross pathology or histopathology. So quite a wide range of teaching um, across um, quite a, 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 di a diverse group of um, students and courses. So the diagnostic service uh, provided by a university will very much vary depending on which university you're working at. Uh, here at Nottingham, we offer a diagnostic service for small animals um, and large animals. Um, and we perform the postmortem examination and then we also um, go ahead with the histopathology as well. So the caseload uh, seen in universities, again, really will vary depending on where you work. Uh, so at Nottingham, um, uh, the caseload might vary from um, one or two cases in a day, maybe up to six or seven cases. Um, and, and again, this really does vary and the uh, sort of load of species. So the variety of species that we see, again, is going to vary depending where you are. 
Within academia, there are many opportunities to uh, get involved with research. So it might be running undergraduate student research projects, which will be quite short research projects, through to um, leading your own research group. And again, it, it, this really depends on the individual, so what you want to do um, and what your job role within the university is. Um, and uh, the research can involve anything from a sort of molecular techniques, uh, histopathology, um, gross pathology, and uh, it really, there's really sort of a, a huge um, range of opportunities to work with other people uh, in different fields. So actually as a veterinary pathologist, you can do the histopathology or be involved in, um, in sort of molecular techniques uh, in loads of different projects. So have quite a small role, but in lots of different projects, but you might be somebody that um, actually leads a research group or supervises a lot of PhD students. So again, um, lots of opportunities to, uh, to do lots of different things. So the thing that I quite like about working as a veterinary pathologist in academia is that these three areas often overlap. So we might be doing a post-mortem examination of a sheep in the PM room. Um, so we're trying to make a diagnosis that we can feed back to the vet and the farmer. Uh, but we're also um, might be teaching final year vet students um, how to systematically perform a post-mortem examination. And perhaps we're collecting some samples for a research project uh, at the same time. So um, lots of different things going on, lots of sort of flexibility for um, making the role um, be something that you want it to be. Um, and again, this very much depends on, on where you are and, and what the university expects from you. Um, but I really like that I get to work with lots of different people um, working in lots of different areas of veterinary medicine, um, but also in um, other uh, working in other areas and other parts of the university as well. So I'm just going to talk briefly now about farm animal pathology. I've, I've kind of kept the two separate because obviously some people will work in academia um, and, um, and not do farm animal pathology and some people might do farm animal pathology and not be working in a university. So this is a very uh, sort of broad overview as to um, what farm animal pathology is. So in general, farm animal um, veterinary pathology services uh, in the UK, um, certainly, and also I think in, in many other countries around the world, these services are primarily provided by government agencies. So here in the UK, we've got the Animal and Plant Health Agency that uh, provides these services to England and Wales, the SIUC or, the, or SAC Consulting up in Scotland, um, and AFB in Northern Ireland. And I've listed these for you just because um, they, there's some really nice information uh, on these websites. They've got some really nice resources um, and they'll, these websites will tell you a little bit more about um, how these government agencies operate um, and uh, what sort of services they provide. So do please go and have a look at their websites um, if you want more information about farm animal pathology services. So these government agencies work with uh, livestock keepers and farmers, um, the livestock industry, the vets working in practice, um, and also academic institutes um, to really deliver a good service for farm animal pathology so they can um, feed back uh, um, diagnoses to vets working in practice and the farmers that they're working with. But also at the same time, they're collecting a lot of information um, to make um, a very sort of robust the surveillance um, system. And so lots of information coming from all these different parts of the industry to give us a picture about what diseases we've got in our country, um, what diseases might be new and emerging. Uh, it gives us an idea of um, zoonotic diseases, notifiable diseases. Uh, we can collect information on things like um, anthelmintic resistance or um, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so loads of different areas um, that really feed into uh, making sure we can reduce the amount of disease in our farm animals, that they are as healthy as possible, that their welfare is as good as possible, and also that we are keeping um, people safe through uh, sort of keeping our animals healthy. So ensuring we've got a safe food supply chain um, and also uh, trying to reduce the risk of, of zoonotic diseases. So there's a few different careers that are available in farm animal pathology. Uh, we need to remember that um, actually on the farm, if you're working as a private veterinary surgeon, so uh, as a clinician, um, there is uh, often some scope for performing uh, post-mortem examinations um, in the field or, or on farm. Um, but if you want to be doing farm animal pathology as a sort of full-time um, career, then uh, you'll want to work in a lab. And again, I found um, 
a blog for you from the APHA website that talks all about uh, what it's like to be a veterinary investigation officer. So in the UK, veterinary investigation officers are the vets that work in the government laboratories um, and uh, do a lot of post-mortem examinations but also um, work on disease surveillance. So that's one option um, for a, a sort of career in farm, farm pathology here in the UK. Um, you could also be a, a veterinary pathologist um, which uh, who focus more on sort of histopathology uh, as well as possibly the gross postmortems as, as well. So what does my working day look like? I thought I would go through um, a working day in normal times. Things are still a little bit up in the air at the moment with the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, but in general, uh, I sort of use the morning for catching up on office work, so emails, phone calls, uh, finishing off reports, um, reading histopathology slides um, and uh, doing things like uh, writing any papers that I might need to, that I might be involved with or um, delivering, delivering undergraduate teaching. So that might be uh, lectures or um, delivering histology practicals in, uh, in the lab for first and second years. Try and always have a lunch break. I think that's quite important and then we head into the post-mortem room in the afternoon for uh, post-mortem examinations um, which most often will also include teaching undergraduate students um, and also uh, postgraduate students as well and then I try to use the uh, final sort of hour hour and a half of the day to um, write reports from um, the post-mortems that we've performed uh, phone the vets um, to discuss what we found uh, and again catch up with any phone calls. So I would say broadly in academia you do have um, a kind of nine to five working day uh, with, with a lunch break but it does obviously just massively depend on caseload and, and what else is going on. So um, things can go a little bit out the window if, if it gets very busy. So outside of work hours, um, I've only just passed my exams, so I'm uh, I'm really trying to keep the amount of work that I do outside of work hours to a minimum. Um, but I do often read around cases um, and uh, do courses and things um, in my own time if if needed. But I am definitely trying to keep that to a minimum at the moment. So why did I choose farm pathology, and what do I like about it? I think really for me. Farm pathology has a really important place in um, improving health and welfare of farm animals and in keeping uh, people safe um, as well as um, as well as the animals. So I find it really interesting. It's a massive challenge. Um, pathology definitely is not easy, um, but I find it really rewarding. And I, I think it's really nice when we can solve a problem um, that that hasn't been able to be solved um, before. Uh, before the, the animal came to us. So um, yeah, I really, really enjoy it. I really like the species that I work with. Um, I really enjoy the people that I work with. I think it's really important to um, to really uh, work closely with the vets and, and with the farmers as well. Um, and yeah, so for me, I think there's, there's many things that I like about it. So I've listed um, a few resources for you uh, if you are interested in um, pathology. So these are not necessarily farm animal specific. Um, we're really lucky at the moment. The amount of uh, resources that are coming out of um, the C.L. Davis Thompson Foundation is just uh, incredible. So have a look at the website. Um, have a look at Noah's archive. Uh, hundreds of gross images to have a look at. Um, the YouTube channel is absolutely fantastic. So uh, they've got a huge range of lectures on, across the species, um, loads of gross quizzes, uh, and um, they've also got a, uh, a Facebook group and, and they're on Twitter as well. So um, do please check these out. There's, if you're into veterinary pathology, then these are really useful. Um, Histopathology wise, if you have a look at the Joint Pathology Centre's VSPO and Wednesday slide conference pages, there's loads of histo slides with descriptions up there for you to have a look at. European College of Veterinary Pathology, American College of Veterinary Pathology, the British Society of Veterinary Pathology, uh, the Royal College of Pathologists um, and many others and, and especially um, around the world, there'll be a huge number of organisations. So have a look at their um, at their websites and and loads of resources listed on there. Uh, I really like um, Twitter and Facebook for sort of keeping up to date with things. So um, I follow the FAO, the OIE, and 
ProMed websites for sort of the disease alerts. Um, there's a huge number of medical and veterinary pathologists uh, on Twitter, which I think is is great. Um, and also lots of vets and farmers, um, which I find really useful for sort of seeing what's happening um, and being able to discuss cases. And then textbook wise, I've put this photo up here of the main textbooks that I used for my exams just gone. Um, so Robbins and Cotran Pathologic Basis of Disease is actually um, a human textbook, but we use the first 10 chapters for our um, board examinations. Pathologic Basis of Veterinary Disease is the one that I tend to recommend for the vet students here at Nottingham. It's got loads of really useful paper, um, photos. Uh, and then um, the Jubb and Kennedy three volumes, uh, Pathology of Domestic Animals, um, is also one of the main textbooks that we use for our residency and certainly beyond. Um, I've also listed the Bovine Pathology, a textbook and Colour Atlas, uh, which is a fairly new book that came out um, if you are into bovine pathology. So thank you very much for listening. Um, this is the last talk from the speakers and I uh, look forward to joining you in person um, for a live Q&A session next. Thank you.